Good afternoon, and thank you again for joining us at the 2021 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Emily Johnson, and I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. It's my pleasure to introduce our panel, Alternative Investing Teams and SPACs. Our panelists today are Billy Bean, Executive Vice President of Baseball Operations, Oakland A's, John Collins, CEO at Sports Entertainment Acquisition Corp., Josh Harris, founder of Apollo and founder and managing general partner of Harris Blitzer Sports and Entertainment, and Jason Robbins, CEO of DraftKings. Our panel will be moderated by Saj Charian, partner of Kinetic, which owns Fanatics. The panel will run for 35 minutes and we will leave 10 minutes at the end for questions. Please use the chat on the right side of the window for discussions during the panel and the Q&A option, also on the right, to submit questions to our panelists. You can also submit questions on Twitter using the hashtag Show me the money ball. Questions will then be selected by the moderator. With that, I will turn it over to Saj. Thanks, Emily. Thrilled to be back uh, at MIT, albeit virtually this year, for my fifth tour as moderator of the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference panel on investing. This year, we are doubling down on alternative investments, talking to four of the sports industry's top leaders for their take on the best place to put your hard-earned dollars and uh, Bitcoins. Uh, we will ask them for their insight into SPACs and NFTs. We will then dig into aspects of team ownership and building sports businesses from raising capital to building teams to investing in innovation. And next, our panelists will share their collective wisdom for the aspiring uh, investors and entrepreneurs around the Zoom. And before we wrap, our panel will answer questions from you, the audience. So get ready. You know, I love this conference. Uh, because our audience is full of aspiring sports business entrepreneurs, with many wondering just how to launch a career in sports. So let us start by asking our panel how they got their start in the business of sports. John, you are one of the two baseball players on our panel. How did you get from pitching college ball to league executive roles at the NFL and NHL and CEO roles at the Cleveland Browns and on location? Thanks, Saj. I, I, uh, I wouldn't have uh, written that with Billy here and, uh, and Josh. I maybe would have downplayed that college career of mine. But, you know, I, I left when I left college, I got into advertising. Um, it wasn't quite the Mad Men days, but it was still a pretty vibrant, uh, youthful um, uh, time in advertising. And it really forced me to, to do something which has really served me well throughout my whole career, which is really to put the customer, put the fan at the center of everything you do. So you'd spend a lot of time, you know, thinking about what that unique selling proposition is, how to create that connection with that demographic or that fan, and then basically use all the levers around a business model to monetize that, right? Create that emotional connection, get them to do what you want to do. I worked on a bunch of brands that ultimately had a young male demographic. Um, and at the time that was kind of the key sports demographic. It no longer is. But, um, and as I got to do that, I began to meet a bunch of the people across the leagues and the clubs. And in particular, the guys at the NFL. So my first job offer, you know, once I was leaving the advertising agency business was to go down and work for Steve Sable at NFL Films which, you know, for me was, was kind of the culmination of what I had been doing for six years. Uh, NFL Films was really, you know, if you think about um, the, the way that they sort of promoted and took you inside the game, you'd watch the football game, you'd see the highlights, but then you'd still watch NFL Films because they, saw you, they showed you something else around the game. They took you inside it in a way that other people hadn't uh, had never really experienced before. And so for me, that was just, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was like working for Walt Disney uh, when Walt Disney was running the company. It was a phenomenal time and it kind of left, there was so much opportunity and so much growth going on at the NFL that, you know, I spent 15 years there, ultimately went, went to a club. But for me, it was really, you know, as a guy who, you know, couldn't play the game and, uh, you know, it was another way to approach the sport and be able to tap into that sort of passion, that emotional connection that fans feel for the game, which makes it so incredible. Now, Josh, you've been a private equity investor most of your career, most notably as one of the founders of PE firm Apollo. 
Why did you decide to invest in sports, starting with the Sixers, who I'd like to remind those zooming in from Boston are currently fighting uh, the Nets for the top spot in the NBA's Eastern Conference? I don't usually get to say that uh, at this conference. Yes, sir. Um, go Sixers. Um, well, first of all, I was always really passionate about sports. I was a college wrestler and I played, I was a soccer player, a wrestler, and I always just loved it, you know, so it was in my blood and I had an emotional connection to it. And um, I was in uh, Philly at Penn as a freshman when the Sixers won, uh, last won the NBA championship. And I was there when uh, Moses Malone and Dr. J and Maurice Cheeks made it happen. And uh, and so I watched the city come together and it just was something that indelibly stuck with me. And, um, you know, as uh, things had gone well at Apollo, um, I became aware in 2010 that uh, Comcast uh, might be willing to part with the Sixers. And uh, the Sixers were part of um, Comcast Spectacor, uh, which had the Flyers and the arena and using a page out of my day job, <clears throat> I had um, learned how to navigate very complicated acquisitions. And uh, I led a group, uh, you know, with none other than Michael Rubin uh, and uh, David Blitzer, amongst others. And we uh, were able to go through an 18 month, what we call corporate carve out process, where literally we had to put in place uh, literally hundreds of agreements between the Flyers, the Sixers, the arena, lease. And lo and behold, 18 months later, um, uh, I felt, you know, both the opportunity to own what I saw one, one of the truly great basketball franchises, but also the responsibility to bring to try to bring it back. And uh, so we we were able to um, and reconnect with the city and uh, make the team great again. And so we did it. And uh, it's been an incredible journey. Um, and, uh, you know, both in terms of being around some of the best um, athletes in the world. Uh, and, 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 you know, a lot of times great athletes are great human beings. And so it's, it was incredible watching last year, you know, Joel and Ben and others, uh, PK Subin at the devil step up and uh, really lead the city through a pandemic and, you know, do more than, you know, step up and, uh, you know, go through some of the racial justice issues we were all experiencing Elton Brand. And then uh, in 2013, uh, we, the, we took it, taking another page out of all of our day jobs, we acquired the New Jersey Devils. They had built a great stadium, the Prudential Center, but run out of money. And so we, fed, we paid down the banks and took over the Devils. And uh, then in 2015, the same group of partners, um, along with some from London, bought a Premier League club called Crystal Palace. And so... I would say that for me, sports was in my blood. And then also I feel like, um, you know, I, I started off in Philly. My mom was from Philly. Uh, my grandfather was a U.S. postal worker in Philly. I really wanted to connect with Philly. I love the, you know, when you, when you are involved with a sports team, you realize it's a public asset. You're just a custodian and your job is to uh, win for the city and to take care of the city. And, Philadelphia and Newark and South London are all places that, um, you know, that, that can, that there are people in need. And so that's been great. And then I've enjoyed being around the athletes and I enjoy competing, you know, as we, as we all, as we all get older, uh, you know, you can, you, you know, being able to have a vehicle to really try to win uh, and do your best is really relevant and important, exciting for me. So it's been a lot of fun and I can't wait uh, to continue, continue the journey. Yeah. So Jason, you were an early mover into daily fantasy and the online sports betting spaces. What about the business of sports attracted you? Well, uh, like John, uh, Josh, I was a huge lifelong sports fan. Um, <clears throat> unlike them, I found out uh, much earlier that I wasn't going to be able to play. I was probably, you know, closer to I don't know, eight years old, maybe when I found out. So uh, that was quite clear. And I, I did play as an alternate on the high school tennis team, so I made I made that work at least. But um, you know, really, it was for me just always a personal passion. Never something I thought was going to be a business endeavor. I kind of stumbled into it just because um, you know I liked the idea when my co-founder Matt brought it to me. We had been looking to you know do something entrepreneurial for many years and batted around a number of ideas. Had some stops and starts. Nothing really stuck that seemed like it was, you know, the thing that we really wanted to go after and, and go all in on. And 
when he brought this idea to me and to my other co-founder, Paul, we just jumped all over it. We knew this was the one and, um, you know, worked many hours uh, after our day jobs and on weekends, um, probably, you know, pulling 40, 50 hours on the side of already a 40 to 50 hour uh, week of day job and eventually, um, you know, raised a little bit of money and left. But uh, it was more a happy coincidence that it was a sports related company. I actually, many, for many years, thought it was a mistake to uh, start a business in something that you were personally passionate about because I thought you, I wouldn't be able to be objective about the product and the customer experience. I'd just be building, you know, the product that I wanted. Um, as it turns out, I think it's been a benefit. And, you know, the more people that we brought in to have different perspectives and the more you're willing to listen to them, you know, that hasn't really been an issue. And I think that's really helped actually uh, understanding the customer at a deep level, understanding, you know, who they are, um, being that I was kind of the core customer. I was the one playing fantasy and for many years betting uh, prior to starting the business. So, um, you know, it was more of a, a lucky coincidence that I got into something I was passionate about. I never really saw uh, sought after this. So you ended up taking two 40 to 50 hour day jobs and now you're working 120 hours, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, what I learned is you can't actually cut the hours back. You just have to concentrate on one thing. And so that's, uh, that's it. Although you're right, it's probably a little bit more than that even now, but I'm hoping one day we can get it under a hundred a week. There you go. So Billy, you're, you are the other baseball player on the panel, uh, but the only one who had uh, Brad Pitt uh, portray their life story on the big screen. So I think most of us know how you got into sports, but tell us how you went from playing sports to the front office and ultimately investing in sports. Yeah, well, usually these panels like this uh, creates huge disappointment for the, when you tell people that Brad Pitt played me. So thanks for that, Sasha. Actually, this panel is actually a microcosm of any success that would be attributed to me. I'm literally, I'm a, a, actually, I, I always kind of kid, but I'm, I'm only half kidding, is that I surround myself with people smarter than I am. And, it seemed, and I just try and execute on their ideas. And uh, so the fact that I'm on this panel is a little bit humbling. But uh, you know, I came in a, what used to be a traditional route, Saj, as you mentioned, as a player. And I say used to be a traditional route because I think what's happened, and I think because of conferences like these, running a sports team as in terms of an executive, and even from an ownership standpoint, has become a meritocracy. Whereas at some point, it was kind of always an insider's game, even from an ownership level. And uh, for me, the last 15 to 20 years, and again, conferences like this, I think are uh, one of the reasons is, number one, there's too much, too much at risk, too much money involved. Uh, there's too much information out there to just basically continue to sort of hire the way we used to hire, which is guys like myself, which was ex-players. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I came up the traditional route. In fact, it's funny, listen to Jason. I was a... Growing up, I, I, for me, sports was just a vehicle, really, to create an opportunity. I came from a long line of military officers, so I was either going to become a military officer, but my parents said, listen, you know, if you play sports, it'll create an opportunity to get into a university I would have never sniffed, and ultimately, that led to my acceptance to Stanford, and, uh, uh, but at that point, it was, uh, for me, everything else from that point, it was all gravy. Because I was a little bit like, 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 like uh, people on this panel. I spent my weekends playing, but I also spent my weekends creating, playing uh, Stratomatic, creating, playing all-time all-star uh, weekend tournaments. Uh, for me, uh, even playing was, a, was an opportunity, really just a means to an end, because I ultimately wanted to run a team, and I ultimately wanted to own a team, and I wanted to be part of that, that equity share and part of that, that growth. Uh, which I was fortunate. I had a great owner who sort of, and I know one of the things we're going to talk about, a, an owner who, who thought, thought it was a great idea to give his top executive equity. And, uh, and, and that was in Lou Wolf and, and John Fisher. So I'm very, very fortunate that they saw the same vision. And, and I've, again, been able to share in sort of the growth of sports and some of the things that I've created, which I think is ultimately a good idea because I think the best executives in sports are the ones who are managing that thing like they own it. I mean, if you think of the two modern day executives that come to mind, I don't think they had equity, but if you think of Belichick and Alex Ferguson, the reason they were great at what they did is because they managed it like they owned it. And they made decisions that were good for the short term, good for the long term. And for me, that was always interesting. And being part of that process was really as a player was something I always wanted to do. Uh, I found the business of sports fascinating. I also find now what we're doing, what's going on now is, that, you know, just this conversation we're having. You know, Josh owns Crystal Palace. He owns the New Jersey Devils, you know. I, I love the globalization of sports. I love that the world is smaller. I, I always keep an eye on internet travel. Someday we're going to be able to go from San Francisco to London in maybe two hours, which would be hopefully in my lifetime, which is going to create more synergies between sports. Uh, you know, I've gotten really interested in a lot of other things. I think, again, my passion has always been 
playing was a vehicle to give me the opportunity to, to be in a situation where I am now, where I'm a, uh, an equity holder in the Oakland A's and in other sports businesses as well. Thanks for, uh, for, for, for sharing that. Um, you know, at Fanatics, the business where I spend most of my time, we've been stalked by months by SPACs. And for those in the audience who have spent the pandemic living under a rock, a SPAC or a special purpose acquisition company is a company created for the sole purpose of uh, raising capital to acquire a private company and taking it public. Now, about five years ago, there were about 13 SPACs that ipo Last year, that number was nearly 250. And I think in sports, it really hasn't been any different. As of last month, there were 61 sports-related SPACs formed this year alone versus uh, just five for all of 2019. And it appears that athletes from Shaquille O'Neal and Steph Curry to Serena Williams and Naomi Osaka to uh, Tony Hawk and Odell Beckham Jr. are all jumping into the SPAC mania. Uh, so Billy, what got you interested in leading a SPAC and why do you think so many professional athletes are following suit? Well, I won't comment too much because the guy who should probably be speaking is Jason, but uh, <laughs> given the, the success of things, but listen, I, in short, and again, I'll be real brief because we're you know, a public company right now and there's, and, and uh, I wanna make sure that I'm very brief on, on these comments, but was the idea the capital structures of you know ownership are probably gonna have to change because the idea that uh, that you're just going to rely on a bunch of people to write two and a half billion dollar checks for franchises and expect that uh, the or the uh, the value is going to continue to rise is probably unrealistic I think this is just another creative way uh, to create value within the business uh, again I, I <laughs> You know, when we, we uh, Red Ball came, became public in August, and uh, which it seemed like it seemed pretty novel at that time. But as you mentioned, now uh, not only are there a lot of a lot of SPACs out there, but a lot of people and a lot of friends of mine that I had no idea. I mean, that uh, were even interested in doing it. But I, again, I think this is just a uh, a creative capital structure that's going to be a part of the future, not just in sports, but a lot of businesses. All right, well, I'm going to get to Jason in a second, but John, I want to I want to go to you because you scaled on location experiences from 35 million to 650 million in revenue, largely backed by private equity. So why was a SPAC interesting for your next CEO gig? So look, I, we had gone through uh, an incredible period of growth, as you mentioned, for on location. And it was it was a lot of fun, but it was a real grind. And I think when, we, when it came out the other end, I, I did have some other opportunities, but uh, I really felt as if I wanted to, I I'd first understood the power of having capital and how you could really scale a business, you know, working for leagues, you know, which I'd done my whole career, you know, you never really had that opportunity. And so, you know, the idea of acquiring companies, scaling the businesses, combining managements really appealed to me. Um, but I never really considered myself, you know, you got Josh on the panel. I mean, I never considered myself a finance guy or, a, or certainly an M&A guy. But Eric Grubman, who uh, came over from the NFL as chairman of uh, On Location for that last, you know, that last sale to Endeavor, um, really was the first guy to talk to me about SPACs. And ultimately, we put together a group, which I think really sort of, as Billy said, you know, we had a lot of really smart people, myself not included, you know, who really knew what they were doing. So Eric's got a very unique background in that he was, you know, he was at Goldman uh, he was a partner there, came over to the NFL, did some of the most complex transactions that a sports league would have to do. Um, Chris Shumway uh, from Shumway Capital was a, a, you know, sort of a, a legendary hedge fund investor, was part of Tiger Management, then ran uh, Shumway Capital, took it up to about a $9, $10 billion fund. You know, he was part of the group. So we had that real investor point of view. And then PJT, who you know I, I regard as one of the most trusted and respected advisors in the sports and entertainment space. So we really felt like with that group, um, we would be able to deliver on this promise, which was you know we were going to really have proprietary sourcing of of ideas, uh, potential mergers, that we would have the financial, the strategic, and the operational chops to partner with the management team that wanted that. Right. And, and for us, uh, we launched in October. We raised uh, 450 million and, you know, we, we've been in the market. We've kind of ripped through uh, about 80 or 90 companies and we've gotten to a handful that we think are really good prospects and we're focused on that. So, Thanks. Jason, a year ago, you know, as we were talking about, very few people in sports were talking about SPACs. 
And yet you chose to take DraftKings public by a SPAC versus a traditional IPO. Why was this the right vehicle for DraftKings? Well, um, you know, you mentioned uh, when you opened this seg segment of, of the uh, panel that you have a number of SPACs chasing Fanatics, which doesn't surprise me. Fanatics is a great company. And um, I think, you know, back when we did our SPAC uh, and decided to do it, um, everybody told me, if you're a great company, don't do a SPAC. It was sort of like SPAC was a four letter word, um, not the good kind. And everybody said to me, you know, why would you do that? You're going to taint your brand. Um, people don't think of SPACs as vehicles for good companies. They think of them for companies that can't get public the normal way. And the reason I wanted to do it was because we were trying to pull off a fairly unique transaction. We were in the midst of uh, attempting to buy a company called SB Tech, which is a sports betting a technology platform that we felt was critical part of our infrastructure. We, we you know, we built all of our in-house technology prior to that. And this was something where the sports betting market was just developing so quickly that we didn't have time to build something. So we ended up using a third party platform called Canby. They've been great, no complaints there, but we're really, we're a company that, you know, really needs to control our whole vertical uh, product and technology stack to be able to do the types of things we want to do. And we just couldn't do that, um, you know, with a third party, uh, you know, running it for us. So we decided we needed to buy something. We settled in on this company, SB Tech, and we really had two options because we also wanted to go public at some point. We said option one was we go do a PE deal or maybe raise some debt and buy this company and then do it, then go public. Um, option two is we do it all at once. And um, this was, you know, back in 2019, uh, and, you know, I was thinking at the time the market had been on a decade plus bull run, who knows where it's going to be a year from now, obviously did not foresee COVID coming or anything that's happened since, but I just thought simply because markets cycle, we had a good window, why, why, you know, take this time to do two transactions. Also, once you buy the company, people want to see you integrate it and see some success there, so that stretches it out too. So I was looking at if I split it into two transactions, I'm probably looking at earliest to late 2020, probably more realistically a 2021 IPO. And we just didn't know that the markets were gonna be in a good spot then. So I said, this is a great idea. I can take this vehicle and I can do two transactions in one. I can get out there by you know first quarter, first half of the year, um, you know, capitalize the business. Why wouldn't I do this? And if the only reason is people are like, Hey, this is like a weird thing. Why would you do a SPAC? Like that just wasn't good enough for me. I thought this is the perfect fit for what I'm trying to do. And <laughs> we're going to go do it this way. And no one's going to care over the long run, how we got public. They're going to care how we perform once we are public. And I was amazed that not only, you know, did that ended up being true, but even well before that, it seemed like, um, you know, all of a sudden it went from SPACs being this thing that only bad companies would consider to, you know, why shouldn't every company consider a SPAC? And all of a sudden there are some SPACs out there. And, uh, you know, I think that that's been something that in some ways has been a point of, of, of pride. In other ways, I'm like, geez, I hope we're not over the long term. Our legacy isn't we're the company that started the SPAC craze. And that's as far as it goes. Uh, hopefully we'll <coughs> Um, but it's really interesting to see how something in literally, you know, months, not even a year span went from being kind of a taboo way to go public to such a commonplace vehicle. And I think it's great because it gives companies more freedom. They're, they're having multiple routes to go to market. I remember when, um, you know, the first big companies started direct listing and everyone looked at it the same way and said, why would you do that? And, and now if you don't need capital, direct listing is a great way to go public. So. I think it's just one of those things where, um, you know, having options is great. It's not the right fit for every company. Um, you have to have, you know, a, a certain profile, I think, for a SPAC to be something that makes sense. But for the right companies, it's a great vehicle. So for you, it was speed. What's your advice to, to other sports entrepreneurs? Oh, sorry. I say speed and also being able to do a, a, a merger. And basically what we did is we merged three companies together. Um, and you can't do that with the traditional IPO. So that was really, it was, it was speed. And I guess you're right, it's speed because instead of doing two transactions, we did one. And I'm sorry, what was your question? No, and so, and so what's your advice to entrepreneurs that are similarly thinking about going public? You know, how, how should they think about, as you mentioned, direct listings versus the traditional route versus SPACs? Like, you know, how, how should they be thinking about that? Well, I think first, you know, you mentioned in the beginning, as I said, SPACs are chasing you guys now. And one of the interesting things that's happened is now SPACs, as opposed to before companies deciding, hey, I should go public and then figuring it out. Um, so the first thing I think that everybody should ask, and it's surprising 
how many people have come to me and said, what do you think should I do a SPAC? And I asked them the question like, well, do you want to go public? And they go, I don't know. I'm like, well, you got to answer that question first before you decide whether you want to do a SPAC or not. If you don't want to go public, you shouldn't be considering a SPAC, an IPO or any public process. If you do decide you want to go public, I think if you need capital, then you either do an IPO or a SPAC. Um, direct listing obviously doesn't make sense, although you could do it and then do a follow on later, but I think it makes sense to raise through the public process. And, um, you know, I think there's a few different cases where SPAC would make sense. Um, the one that I, you know, described for us earlier, uh, trying to do a complicated transaction where you're trying to, you know, do more than one um, deal at a time, trying to buy another company, I think that's the way to do it. The other thing would, or a good reason to do it. The other thing which I didn't really understand because I hadn't um, gone through the process is you can also do a lot more um, during the SPAC process than you can during the IPO process in terms of putting out forward looking projections, doing price discovery. So if you're a company that has a fairly unique profile and there's not a lot of great comps out there and it's gonna be hard for you know an underwriter to really understand how to market you and how to price you and you wanna be able to tell the story of what this is going to become uh, I think that that's also a really great reason to do a SPAC. And the only reason really not to do it is the sponsor economics. But if you know, one of those other uh, situations is, um, you know, is present, then I think it's, it's fairly nominal for, for a large company to do it. Uh, and then the last thing I'd say is, um, you know, if the sponsor is somebody that really can add value, I think, you know, Billy talking about and John talking about going after certain types of targets, I imagine, you know, focusing on targets where they really can add value and it's not just a check. Uh, and I think that makes a big difference. We did our deal with, uh, you know, a company called Eagle Equity Partners. Harry Sloan is on our board now and he's been tremendous. So uh, really fortunate to have him involved. And I think that, you know, that to me was a big deal too. I'd never run a public company before. I'd never taken a company. Before. So having somebody that knew what they were doing was helpful. Got it. So, I mean, as you said, SPACs are just a means of going public. Uh, the Green Bay Packers, they've been a longstanding publicly owned nonprofit and private equity funds are increasingly taking minority stakes in teams. So this naturally begs the question, should professional sports teams be publicly traded? Now, Josh, as you mentioned, you're the owner of an NBA, NHL, Premier League and some esports teams. Uh, do teams have the DNA to be good public companies? Right. So I think to Billy's point earlier, um, these these are becoming very large businesses and the average team, you know, used to be in the hundreds of millions. And now for many sports, it's in the billions. So um, as that happens in order to the, and as uh, there's also a ton of growth opportunities around these teams, whether it be gaming or uh, globalization, media content or um, gambling or any number of other thing opportunities you mentioned esports uh there's a lot of innovation going on and so the need for capital is going up so you know ultimately right you want to provide you want to allow for as many capital sources as possible to get the lowest cost of capital and so long run i would expect that um whether it's public equity whether it's private equity whether it's uh public equity that originally starts in the form of a spac or whether it's uh high net worth individuals who've been the mainstay capital providers of sports teams. Um, as these things become big businesses, you're gonna see all of these types of tools uh, come in and facilitate the capital markets and the valuation and the capital raising process around uh, the entities. Um, I think when you go public, obviously, and I remember back um, when uh, Blackstone and Apollo and KKR and Carlisle went public, uh, many of the same issues were discussed. Uh, we were private partnerships at the time. Uh, that was an issue. You had to go towards public company governance. Um, we were, um, you know, obviously a confidential, so disclosure. Uh, and then when you go public, obviously you're subject to public securities laws, to earnings, communications, and to other things. And so clearly there are some complexities around these companies going public. And in particular, the leagues, right, uh, are run as uh, affiliations or uh, oligopolies, if you will. And so like how the leagues view the uh, public markets is important. Uh, and so we got to work through all that. But I think all the leagues are looking at, OK, how do we manage these issues? And they are all manageable. What are the things that, how do we allow for and over time think about these entities becoming public. Clearly, 
Um, you know, the MSG is public today. Um, the Braves were public. Uh, the Celtics were public at one point. Uh, and um, so you'll see, uh, so it's happened. Traditionally, the public markets have not been hospitable evaluation environments for sports teams. Like one of the big impediments to the public market so far has been that um, public markets have always valued sports teams at less than private markets. But I think what's happening is as sports grows and as all these growth opportunities get more understood and as people like Billy and John and Jason take uh, sports or sports related businesses public, public markets are now starting to understand what's going on. And they're saying, wow, these are growth entities. And so you could see that evolve and change. And so I would expect over time that um, everyone, all the leagues will look at how do we allow for this in a way that makes sense for our particular league or our particular situation. But right now, um, the NBA, the NHL, um, right now, it's the exception, not the rule. And people are, but there have been moves to allow, as you're saying, uh, private equity, um, dial, Arctos, fund of funds, private investors. And that's the first step to moving these things towards public companies because you're having a validating investor, a sponsor, you know, step up with capital and say, I believe in this growth story. Yeah. Now, John, you mentioned that your SPAC, which uh, you creatively named the Sports Entertainment Acquisition Corp, uh, is deliberately staying away from team franchises. Why, why is that? Well, I, I think we just had our sights, I, you know, we had our sights set on other things. We, you know, we see there, there are so many related industries serving sports and entertainment that we felt there was much more fertile ground there that we wanted to pursue. Um, and, you know, frankly, we followed Billy. So, you know, Billy and Red Ball, you know, was the first sports back, I believe, um, to raise money. And so, you know, we, we felt like that they had clearly signaled that was going to be one of their priorities. And so it wasn't going to be one of ours. We were going to look at the rest of the business. Um, but I happen to agree, you know, with, with Josh and, and with Billy, um, you know, there are some of, of those uh, businesses where they've been really exploited, where you're including multiple U.S. teams, European teams, media networks, you know, service companies, on those kind of platforms in the right market, you know, perhaps that'll be, you know, that'll be the model that ultimately will prove that the private market will, uh, you know, will at least match the private market valuation will at least match what the public valuation is, but it really hasn't, it, it hasn't been quite as successful as, you know, that private market valuation, particularly when you look at a, a control vote and what, what that really means. Got it. So as this is the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference, we can't get too far uh, into our time without talking about data. Uh, Moneyball credits analytics with changing the way baseball and other professional sports are being played. But Billy, my question for you is a little different. How is baseball changing the way analytics is played in the business world? So every year, you know, you recruit data scientists who get their start in sports analytics, working on scalable real world problems. And often this talent is, is kind of bit away by higher paying tech companies. So um, has baseball become, or is it becoming R and D for corporate America? Actually, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that thing. I think, uh, well, first of all, I, I will take credit for making data cool, you know. Uh, but the uh, it, what's it, what's what's really great about what's going on. The, if you look at baseball front office, and I'll speak, I think it's one of the most intelligent industries in the world right now. And 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 I'll explain. You know, I've always sort of looked to Wall Street, looked to Silicon Valley as as originally hiring the best and the brightest. Uh, but when sports started using data and uh, trying to predict uh, player performance and behavior of athletes, uh, we were able to, and I, I think when the book came out, what it attracted, what, what we had now was we had this really sexy business that attracted these incredibly bright minds that we had ignored for 150 years. And if you really think about it, the same people that Josh and Daryl were trying to hire and uh, in, in uh, Philadelphia are the same uh, guys that uh, we're trying to hire in Oakland and the Dodgers are trying to hire, but they're also the same people that Goldman Sachs is trying to hire and uh, Silicon Valley. And you're trying, you guys are trying to hire. Uh, the difference is, is that when they get out of college, and I, this is a, a great, a great opportunity that we have is that they will, uh, they will come work for their favorite sports team right out of the gate for 25 cents on the dollar. And then they'll say, Hey, I'll go work for uh, 
you know, maybe I'll go work for Jason Lade Rob, and now I want to work for Chelsea Football Club, or I want to work for the New York Yankees. And that's a huge amount of sort of human capital that was really ignored for years that we now have access to. I think what's going on, and it, it's true, I mean, I, some of the people that we have working in Oakland, some of the people the Dodgers have, the Yankees have, these are some of the most brilliant young minds. It is an incredibly diverse business now. It's no longer a bunch of ex-players who came up in the business. It's uh, it's uh, diverse in terms of, uh, people, you know, I, my greatest example is Farhan Zaidi, who's the executive vice president of, uh, of, of baseball operations for the Giants. I mean, he, he wasn't even born in this country. He attended MIT. His, uh, his father worked for the Asian Development Bank. Now he's running one of the most, uh, the biggest brands in all of baseball, the San Francisco Giants. That's what's happening in baseball. And I think as a result, I think what you're going to end up finding, I think that you, you, you have these really smart people trying to solve small problems in baseball. And to your point, I think some of these solutions, they come up and, and are going to end up having, uh, you're going to be able to scale them outside of baseball, particularly when it comes to health, uh, say corporate wellness and health, because that's the, that's the, and Josh will tell you, that's the one thing none of us know. We know the data is probably going to uh, lead us to the answer is the health of the athletes, keep them on the field. And if the Los Angeles Dodgers are focusing on one, say, injury that they're trying to prevent their players from having or at least minimize their time spent, that in itself, that, that solution that really a bunch of smart PhDs in a room are trying to solve is really going to have some value outside. And again, that's where I think baseball has become. And I think you're going to see with other sports because the idea that any business is going to ignore the data and the information out there and be successful uh, when competing against a world that is using it is I just it's just not going to happen. I mean, uh, I sort of knew, I remember when the book came out, you know, we never really felt like we had to sort of say much. We sort of felt like, you know, we had a choice, a subjective or an objective approach. And uh, we never really felt like we had to defend the process early on when there was a lot of noise because we have eventually thought that it made total sense that using facts to make decisions was a much better process than, than using gut and sort of uh, hoping for uh, these serendipitous positive results. Uh, and again, I, I, I don't necessarily take credit. I think baseball in itself, again, I'll say it again, I think it's one of the smartest industries in the world. And because it's a, it's a business that people want to be involved in. And we finally have embraced all this, again, this human capital out there uh, and all this data is coming together. And, and again, I think it's, we're gonna, there's going to be problems that are solved in baseball that are actually scalable outside of, of baseball and sports. Uh, shout out to um, MIT Sloan and uh, my, our own Daryl Moore. I guess I can say our own now because, and Billy, and they've been real pioneers in, um, you know, f you know, getting sports to embrace this. And to Billy's point, uh, we can't, Sixers can't compete with uh, Microsoft or Apple or Amazon in terms of what we can pay. But, you know, there's that emotional connection for kid for people that love sports or love their team. And, a lot of people we find uh, Daryl and Billy and others can attract, you know, for some period of time. And they're willing to make that sacrifice because they just love what they do and they have that emotional connection. And so we should any team that's uh, not taking advantage of that leverage, that arbitrage to get like truly exceptional people. They're leaving a real opportunity on the table. And over time, it's going to affect their performance you know, on the field, on the ice, on the pitch, on the court. And so you got to do it to be successful. So I want to go um, to our questions from the audience. We're getting a lot of questions around NFT. So um, I think you, a lot of you probably saw, you know, this week that six-time Super Bowl champion Tom Brady announced that he's getting into the NFT space. NFT, for those that know, don't know, non-fungible token. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and he launched Autograph. So it's an NFT platform that he co-founded to offer digital collectibles. Now, NFTs first created in 2014. I think they're even more popular than SPACs. With, uh, there was a digital artist just sold uh, a, a single NFT for $69 million, uh, a graphic artist people. Um, but now uh, the average NFT costs around $1,400, which is actually a 40% decrease since the, the prices that kind of hit record highs in February. So Jason, I think you signed on as an, adv as an advisor to Tom's Venture. Um, are NFTs the next great alternative investment? Uh, is this a real business or is this just a bubble? Oh, for, I think he, he took a Super Bowl away from Tom. He may not be happy about that. But anyway, he's, I think he's at six. He has seven, right? Is it seven? Yeah. Seven, that's right. My bad. Uh, I, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Big trouble. No, I'm kidding. Don't, um, do, don't do that to Tom. Yeah, never. <laughs> uh, 
But uh, yeah, so I was very fortunate to be able to get involved in that. The uh, person who co-founded it with Tom, Rich Rosenblatt, is a good friend. He's been on my board for many years. And, um, you know, I helped kind of introduce him to NFTs uh, not too long ago. And I mean, my opinion is that anything that's a collectible, including art, can be made into a digital collectible. And I think one of the nice benefits that you get of doing it on the blockchain is you have that authentication um, you know, aspect that, that, that really you know, is um, impenetrable by anything. I think if you look at any type of art or you know, trading card, um, there's always the problem of knockoffs and you have to have some third party verify it. The blockchain solves all that. Um, and it really democratizes it in a way that I think is very interesting. Certainly there are some things that people will prefer in a physical form, um, but I think almost anything could be <clears throat> collectible and I think what's really cool about it too is the ability for the um, artist or, or the creator to partake uh, in the profits from it um, you know on the resale especially in certain types of ecosystems some don't allow for that um, and then the last thing that I would say that I think is really interesting is you can um, similar to sort of the authentication piece the entire history behind it is there on the blockchain. You can see every single sale that's been made of that item, when it happened, who, who did it, what the amount was. Um, you can track everything. Uh, so I think that there's a, a real interesting aspect to having that traceability in the world of collectibles, um, much like what real estate's become, where you can quickly go online and see every single you know assessment of a house or every price that anybody's ever paid for it when it was listed, what offers were made and rejected, things like that. Um, I think that's really made it easier for people to get comfortable buying things at, at higher values. Uh, I do think that we're in a little bit of a hype phase now, and um, you know just like what you saw with Bitcoin in the late 2017 uh, timeframe, you know it came back down to earth a little bit, but then two years later, it was back up three times what it was then, so at its peak. Um, and I think you might see a similar pattern with NFTs where. Um, maybe there's a little bit of a, you know, a, a hype around it now, and I think it will come down um, in the in the short term. But then I think over the long term, it's here to stay, and NFTs will be worth more than they they sold for today, even if there is a short term price correction. Okay, so I'm gonna um, we just have a few minutes left, so I'm gonna hit the rest of the uh, the panel. Um, bubble or, or or real business, Josh? Yeah, like sports memorabilia is part of our culture. It's part of our DNA. We love it. We collect baseball cards. We collect football cards. I don't know about my kids or, you know, some of whom are young, they're on their phones, they're on their devices, they're, they're electronically focused on things. And so it's, it's not a, it is a sustainable business. It's here to stay. Having said that, the Fed, the Federal Reserve, there's 40% more dollars out there. So there's a massive liquefaction, uh, both in terms of the, you know, massive amount of money that the Federal Reserve is pumping into the system, as well as uh, the fiscal stimulus, helicopter money, and all of this stuff is bidding up uh, asset prices and, you know, prices of everything. I mean, it's one of the reasons why SPACs have kind of bubbled up and are coming down. So I think there's definitely elements of frothiness and elements of a bubble around anything that's technology related. Uh, where things are being valued above their fundamental value. But ultimately, right, um, you'll see the valuations uh, go up and down. You'll see frothiness and you'll see periods of uh, less frothiness and more uh, shakeouts. And so you're going to see this gyration. But long run, this is a real business, just like SPACs are a real business. It's just that you're going to see some valuation volatility um, and as the um, Fed raises rates and as the 10 year Treasury goes up, you'll see the prices of all things that are growing probably have a little bit of wind in their face, have a little bit of resistance. But it doesn't mean they're not going to power through it. It's going to ultimately depend on, you know, what company and what industry. And but you you probably are at a sort of robust period right now where the markets are less discerning. And so you might see the values of everything. And so what will happen is it'll be the values of those things that are really sustainable. But as far as NFTs, they're sustainable. Yeah. John, Billy, the last word. I'll give it to you, Billy. Yeah, well, thanks, John. Yeah, I'm going to stay in my lane a little bit here, Saj. Uh, 
I'm going to be a really passe and I always check with Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger before I say anything about any of my own investments. So uh, I'm really just sort of a neophyte when it starts to, you know, when it, when it comes to this. And when I, when uh, Jason was talking about blockchain, I started to think about the fact that my Napoleon autograph that I bid a lot of money for probably wasn't authenticated somewhere along the line. So that's, that's the best I can do. That's fair. Uh, one more thing I'd add really quickly, if we have a minute is, um, I also think there's some reasons to believe that it hasn't peaked yet. Namely, it's actually quite hard to purchase most NFTs now. There's some exceptions like, you know, Dapper Labs with Top Shot has built a fiat currency on ramp. They're subsidizing gas fees. But you go on OpenSea, you got to, you got first you have to have a crypto wallet. You have to have ETH, you have to convert it to wrapped ETH. And then if you want to bid $20 on an item, you got to pay $75 in gas fees to get the transaction. Those are real barriers that I think will get removed in the next year or two. So, you know, Saj, just to just to play off what Jason said, you know, I, I've heard the idea that ultimately this could be attached to a digital ticket, which obviously every team and every venue has been trying to get to as a way to, you know, cap, recapture the secondary market. And so if you go to a Sixers game, you have your digital ticket, whether it's blockchain or some other way, something happens at that game. It's a memory that you want to keep. You get you get an NFT as part of that. And then not only as the IP holder sort of captured that secondary market, but you're also delivering real value to the customer at the end of the day for that memory of how they came to the venue and you know how important it was to them. To me, that that's the way it begins to move out of kind of a more specialty area, collectible, into a more mainstream, as, as Jason's saying, how ultimately everybody begins to use it as just part of their everyday life. Great. Well, well John, you have the last word. Uh, we're running out of time. Uh, so on behalf of Jessica, Daryl, and the entire student-led team here at MIT Sloan, I'd like to thank our panelists for sharing their stories and insights with us today. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you for having us. Thank you.